Good evening, you guys. How's everybody doing? Good. It's, yes, it's really tired. Yeah. We turn that speaker just a little bit that way. I don't know if that's where I'm getting that. All uh, right. Right. Yep, yep, yep. A little right there. Yeah. All right. That sounds better for me. All right. No. All right. How about that? You know what? My reverb's high? No, it's not. Huh? <laughs> I don't, it's, there, it's getting feedback from, from something. Well, I'll just turn it down. All right, that's probably better. But anyways, um, good evening. Welcome to Expound Bible Church. If you guys would open up your Bibles to Leviticus 15. Leviticus chapter 15. We're going to cover 15 and 16. In 15, we're going to continue in the ritual laws that lead to purity and or impurity and by and far god showing us what not to do sometimes it's easier to know what not to do than to know what to do and in this case god's going to tell us the specific things in this chapter that make us unclean one of the things that we're going to see throughout chapter 15 is by and far by and far we are not in control of most of the things that are going to make us impure ritualistically speaking and that's a tough place to be because the people of this era sought to live holy. They sought to live righteously. They sought to do everything in accordance with God's righteous law. But no matter how hard they tried, there were things that were outside of their grasp. There were things that were outside of their abilities that made them unclean regardless. And there was nothing they could do about it. They were unclean and that's all there was to it. And to get clean, you had to go through a ritualistic process. Typically, it involved being segregated from Israel. You had to go away from people, away from the camp, bless you. Then you had to wash. Then you had to come and make sacrifices for your impurities. It's a lot to take on. I, I, as I was studying this, I was thinking like, my word, the weight that these people had to bear on their shoulders in order to be righteous before God is unrealistic it's unrealistic you look at what the jews had to uphold and it's just it's not realistic and it's one of the things that baffles me when we get to like the new testament and they're striving with everything in them to live this mannerism to live according to this because it's just a dog and pony show and the craziest part is the people who put on the perception that they were living this righteous status or often, more often than not, they were in lie. They weren't being straight. They weren't being honest. They were as defiled as the next. As a matter of fact, the people that appeared to be the most upright and righteous were the ones that Jesus condemned most. I should say rebuked most. But I mean, some of them got straight thrown under the bush of condemnation, under the fire of condemnation. And he tells them, repent, or you're going to see the flames of hell, essentially. And so... As we get into chapter 15, brace yourselves. And especially the women. You know, we're going to find that women lived at least, if not more than half of their lives in impurity. Yeah. At, at least half, if not more realistically, more than half of their lives, they were segregated for impure purposes. And it's not like they were off hooking. You know, bless you. They were things that they had no control over. Now, let's get into it. Chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. It says, Now it came about after this. Oh, I'm in the wrong book. I'm in Second Samuel. We're about to talk about Absalom again. That creep. <laughs> Let me actually fix that. I was like, I'm in the wrong chapter. If you want to hear about Absalom, you've got to come on Sunday nights. Chapter 15 in Leviticus. Yahweh also spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. Now again, I want to mention that God spoke to Moses and to Aaron. I can't get over or past the fact that God raised up spokesmen to speak through it would have been easy enough for God to address Israel himself. But that's not the order in which God has set himself apart to address his people. Even in the church, the church, we are blessed with the Holy Spirit. God has given us his Holy Spirit to give us wisdom, to give us understanding, to give us direction, to give us conviction, to lead us, guide us, direct us, to sanctify us. 
to bring us into salvation. God's Holy Spirit resides in those who are born again. Born again is a very key term. It's When we talk about belief, it's belief that re- leads to rebirth. If there's no rebirth, there's no born again. If there's no born again, there's no salvation. If there's no salvation, you are on a first class trip to hell. Reborn is a really important term in the New Testament, in the Bible. And even in the New Testament, although we have the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, direct, convict, God has still raised up His spokesmen. And in the church, it's a little bit different. Like, yes, the pastor is one of those persons, but it can be the person sitting right next to you. God uses His body to speak life into those who are His. Now, there does come a certain weight with church authority. We see that throughout the New Testament. I've been reading through Acts in my personal time. And, you know, and there is an, an order. And I'll give you an example. The Apostle Paul, before he was known as Paul, he was Saul. Intellectually untouchable. I mean, this dude was probably the smartest guy ever after Jesus. I'd imagine throughout history, this is one of the most influential men throughout history. If you, guys, you guys know the difference between Christians and Catholics, right? Yeah, Paul's the one that started that. How do I mean that? Well, this guy by the name of Martin Luther, this 16th century, 15th century monk, was reading Paul's letter to the Romans. And he was deducing what Paul was saying to the Romans, and he realized we're justified by faith through grace. Not by the works of the law like Catholicism was proposing and impeding on the people. And that created the Reformation the Great Reformation, where we were, or let me back up here. Yeah, it was a Reformation for sure. But what happened is we protested the Catholic Church, and that's what Protestantism is. We said, Pope, you're wrong. You're wrong. You can't be selling indulgences. You can't pray someone out of purgatory or hell. Pope, we're not saved by works. You can't say Hail Mary's and get out of hell. You can't say Hail Mary's and our fathers and get to heaven. We're saved by faith through grace, and that was that clean cut club cut cloth that came from Paul absolutely bright man however in Paul's ministry as he began he submitted himself unto a man named Barnabas Barnabas was nothing special but he sure knew how to encourage people everywhere he went he was just an encourager if you were down and out Barnabas was that guy that came up and then you felt better yeah you know you're right in the name of Jesus let's go And it wasn't until God raised Paul up to the position that Paul took that leadership and then his voice came with a certain authority and tone. My point is that God has raised up leaders in his body, both Old and New Testament. And in the Old Testament, God has chosen to spoke through Moses and through Aaron. We're going to see later on down the line that that's going to get challenged by the sons of Israel, by the sons of Korah particularly. They're going to challenge Moses. They're going to challenge Aaron. And they're essentially going to say, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to tell us anything? Aren't we sons of the king also? Aren't we part of this congregation? We're holy. We're just as holy as you. Moses goes, hey, oh, oh. this isn't my doing. This is God's doing. You know what? God, let's get you in between this. Paraphrasing here. This is the Walter version. And basically, Moses tells the people, if you're with Korah, stand with Korah. And if you're not, get away from them. And Korah's family stands with him. Because you know how it is. Whenever there's someone in rebellion, we all get our little clique together. And we're going to rebel together, kind of like the devil, right? We always draw people in the rebellion with us. Moses says, get away. God's going to open up. He's going he's, he's to kill them in an unnatural way. And if they don't die unnaturally, I'm wrong. And it says the mouth of the ground opens up. They all fall in. There's nowhere for them to go. It just sucks them up. Blech. And then the ground goes, boom, and shuts on them. That's a pretty unnatural death. I've actually never heard of it outside of that. That's, people fall into canyons, but the ground doesn't split, take in, and then shut back over you. That just doesn't happen. And so God made it a point to separate Moses and Aaron for his purposes. You know, and they're the ones who are speaking these things. And I'd imagine as Israel's hearing this, these are hard things to take in. These are extraordinarily hard things to take in. But it's not Moses and Aaron saying, this is what we demand of you. They're just saying, look, this is what God has told us. We are messengers relaying the message. 
What's the message in chapter 15? When any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. When it talks about the body, it literally means the flesh. And it could be a very specific reference to the genitals. Sorry, there's some young ladies in here. Guys, I hope you've taken health. You're going to hear some things that are just the truth. It's what it is. But it's we're referencing the genitalia. It's the genitals. It's In particular, it's pointing to the men, to the penis. And this is the direction. And for the, a big part of this chapter, dudes, we're under the fire. And he's going to say, if you guys have a discharge, you're unclean. Now, in verse 3, it says, This, moreover, shall be his uncleanness in his discharge. It is uncleanness whether his body allows its discharge to flow or whether his body obstructs its discharge. Now, there is a a condition that it's likely referring to here. It's urethritis. And it can be a bacterial or a viral infection in the penis that creates discharge. And it could swell up and stop the flow or it can allow it through. And it's typically painful. Um, here, I put, it's you know, typically accompanied by pain, burning, and it's a discharge from the urethra. It's often, not always, caused by sexually transmitted disease. Not always, but it often forms as a, as a, it stems from a form of chlamydia. But it's not necessarily chlamydia, but it can be obtained in that way. God says, if you have this, you are unclean. In verse 4 through 6, it says, Every bed on which the person with the discharge lies becomes unclean, and everything on which he sits becomes unclean. Anyone, moreover, who touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And whoever sits on the thing on which the man with the discharge has been sitting shall wash his clothes and bathe in the water and be unclean until evening. And so this uncleanness, when it accompanies the man, whatever he touches, the one who has the discharge, whatever he touches becomes unclean. And so it begs the question whether or not this infection is contagious. And that might be the purpose of not touching. I don't necessarily think so, because we're going to see there's other uncleannesses that are accompanied. There are other uncleannesses that are accompanied that by which if a person touches anything that person touched are also defiled as well. I think it's the idea of the person being unclean is the issue. And he says, anyone who touches anything that the man is sat, uh, sitting on becomes unclean. What I find interesting about these types of issues, these types of, of uncleannesses within the body that the, the law of God you know, brings forward is we see a, a, an issue like this in our culture. And it's not so much the uncleanness that I'm going to talk about, but it's sin. We see that sin presents the same types of issues as the uncleanness. In sin, when, the way sin works is everyone around us becomes affected. And anyone who associates with what we're doing becomes infected. So that's how this works. And in this day, if you had that discharge and you were dirty, if I was dirty, we'll say I have ure urethritis. I hope I never get that. That sounds painful. You know? Again, it doesn't necessarily come by an STD. It can come in many other forms. But that is one way in which it stems. But let's say I had it. I'm sitting on this chair and you decide, I want to sit on Walter's chair. You would be ritually unclean. And you would have to segregate yourself for a period of time and then wash in order to be cleansed. And then you'd have to present sacrifices essentially for your sin. But that's how sin works. When we're in sin, we don't see it quite as clearly. We get infected and we affect everything and everyone around us. And if you've never experienced it, hang out with someone who's in sin. Don't do that. Seriously, don't. Do it. If you do, or if you have, I have, you'll find that when you hang out with people who are in sin, it affects you. It causes you to be distorted in your thoughts. And this is the illogical thinking of most humans. What I'll do is I'll win them. I'm going to go into the trenches. I'm going to hang out with the sinners, my old friend. I'm going to win them to Jesus. And Have you ever tried to lift somebody up? Have you ever tried to lift up somebody who's passed out or dead? I've, I've worked in a mortuary. Dead weight is a real thing. Dead people appear to weigh significantly more. If you were to pick up somebody who's 150 pounds, most of us in here could do it. 
If you were to try to lift a dead person who's 150 pounds, a lot of us wouldn't be able to do it because dead weight is heavier. And it's not actually heavier, it's just different. And my mom, I think, was asking me the other day, like, why is it different? I'm like, well, because when you're alive, right? If you're 150 pounds and I'm lifting you up, you can grab my neck and you can help pull yourself up. You're helping with the weight. You're, 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 you're distributing that weight so that it's more bearable for me. When you're dead, it's just dead. It's all you. you there is no help. There is no readjusting to help with... No, you just, it's all you. <clears throat> And when you're trying to lift someone up, gravity is also working against you. Dead weight's much heavier. And when we go and think that we can win the world, we're fooling ourselves. You know, it's almost like bad company corrupts good morals. <laughs> that's a Bible verse. <laughs> you know, that's what the Bible says. Bad company corrupts good morals. And so when we allow ourselves to be in the presence of people who are sinning. Not to say that we shouldn't associate with sinners. By all means, like, love them, talk to them, but be careful how you interact with them. When I was a young Christian, I remember telling this pastor, and I remember God gave me this. And I remember I was talking to this pastor, and I was explaining to him how I, I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to win a lot of my friends. And he was using this verse, like, bad company corrupts, good morals, just be careful. I'm like, of course, man. I was like, but you know what? Jesus sought to win the sinners. I said, I said, but one thing I've realized about Jesus, pastor, is that when the people started sinning, Jesus was never present. They never sinned in the presence of the Lord. So if you want to win sinners, win them. But if you, they are sinning while you are in their presence, they'll be your downfall. While you're there, witness to them, love on them, show them the love of God. And if they don't want it, you have to leave. Or if they decide they're going to light that blunt, because that's, you know, I hung out with a lot of weed smokers back in the day. And once they had packed that pipe or rolled that blunt, once that lighter sparked, I was like, yo guys, I got to bounce. I can't be here for this. Otherwise, I'm partaking in it in a very real and spiritual way. So I had to go. Sin. It's a lot like the uncleanness of the Old Testament. It affects and infects those whom are around it. In verse 7 and 8, it says, also, whoever touches the person with a discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Or if the man with the discharge spits on one who is clean, he too shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. So whoever the man touches, or whoever touches the man, or if he spits on someone, that's, oh, that's probably not the reference. You know, when we talk, sometimes spit. You ever been talking to somebody and they just, right on your face or right in your eye or something. It's like, <gasps> you start thinking, I hope they don't have STDs or, you know, like, that's happened to me before. I'll be talking to somebody and like a little spit will jump right out their mouth and hit me right in the eyeball. And in my heart, it's racing and I'm just trying to hold my composure like, oh dear Lord, I want to wash my eye now. You know, I'm freaking out. I'm, starting, I'm thinking like, Lord, do they have like AIDS? I almost want to ask him like, you got AIDS? You know, because if you got AIDS, I got to get help. You know, but, you know, I don't say that because that's just... But, you know, people don't get spit on necessarily intentionally. It's, it can be a very unintentional spit. But this is the issue with uncleanness. If you just touch somebody, they're now unclean. They have now, so to speak, contracted uncleanness. Even if you're just innocently talking, I didn't even touch them, but some spit came out and hit them. They are unclean. Now... I want you to imagine, or better yet, let's imagine someone with AIDS, right? You know someone has active HIV. How many of us want to befriend them? Now, the Christianity in us says, of course. But the honesty in us is like, I'll befriend you like through Facebook. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to make a point. I, I don't hate you at all, but like, I want you to know the Lord. But I'm also terrified that like, if you accidentally spit on me, I, I could contract HIV, like legitimate. Like I remember as a kid, when people had spit at each other in school because like, you'd be fighting, you would get charged with assault. And they would talk about how spit, you can transfer diseases through spit. That, that would be a terrible, terrifying concern. Like, ah, I want to show them the love of God, but I also don't want to catch what you got. 
<sighs> Unknowing or knowing, regardless, isolation is likely the outcome of these people. Because if you know somebody's unclean, are you going to want to hang around them? Probably not. Why? Because you want to avoid the contamination, whatever it is. You know, mind you, the Israelites didn't have a full understanding. Actually, we don't even have a full understanding. A lot of the things that we take out of this are assumptions. You know, I don't know if like this is your th urethritis. That's a guess. You know, that this is what some commentators had mentioned. So I looked up what ureth urethritis is, and it's consistent with what's being spoken about, but it can be a number of things. Some contagious, some not contagious. But do you want to roll the dice on whether or not it is or isn't? You know? Verse 7 and 8, he says that the person who gets touched, they shall ha they'll be unclean until evening, and they'll have to wash themselves in the evening. So you would avoid people that were unclean for the sake of you not becoming unclean with them. Again, this brings very religious undertones, but this was the reality of the law. Unfortunately, as Christians, we, we often carry this same ideal into our Christian faith. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not afraid of sinners, and I want them in. And if you're ever in sin, we love you, and we want to help build you up. That, that's a goal. That was an interesting sound that, that just made, but that's one of the goals, right? We want to build you up. We want to see you walk out of a lifestyle of sin and into the righteousness of Christ. But the truth is, we'll never fully walk out of sin. Ever. It'll never happen. Why? Because we're sinners. If you were with us when we taught through Romans, Paul was very, very straightforward on this matter and in this subject. Our minds are renewed. So mentally, on, on the spiritual scale, through the mind, we are cleansed and righteous. Our flesh is not yet renewed. It is still this body of death. That, that's why Paul says, the things that I want to do, the righteousness that I want to do, I don't do it. And the unrighteousness that I don't want to do, I keep doing it. He says, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now that is not an excuse to sin. We do not smear the grace of God in the name of I'll be forgiven, and since I'm a sinner, I might as well. No, we should be actively fighting against our passions and our desires that are anti-Christ, that are against God. And we should be striving to live righteously, but in that striving, you will fall short. So don't think, well, I'm going to go cheat on my spouse because I'm going to fall short. Anymore. Wrong kind, no. It should be more like, yeah, I was kind of added to it, and I said something I shouldn't have. I got to get right. It should be like, yeah, I got mad, so I cheated. That's That's... There's a lot of things I would say to that that might get me in trouble, you know, so no, that's not okay. But you understand what I'm saying, like we will fall, we, we have sin, it's inevitable. And so we don't ever want to have the perception that we don't want sinners here, we want sinners here. But the goal isn't that you perpetuate sin, the goal is that you repent from sin. The goal is that you stand firm in the faith, the goal is that you move forward in your walk. A big amen, right? The, that is the goal. If we were in the Old Testament, you'd get kicked out the church because that would be the law. You messed up, you got to go. The craziest part is, if they were to truly live by these standards, there would be nobody in Israel. <laughs> if they were to be honest. And that's kind of the purpose of the law. Paul tells us in Galatians, the purpose of the law was never to be upheld and kept. It was meant to act as a mirror so as we're reading through all this, I know it gets kind of um, boring because it's just a lot of repetitive stuff and it's a lot of like harsh stuff and it's like, ah. But I want you to consider if you were alive in this day, many of us would be in great agony because we would be removed societally. We'd be outcast. We'd be considered lepers and we'd be considered, you know, disgusting, dirty people. Many of us. Because the law was never meant to be lived out and kept. It was meant to act as a mirror to show us our inability to keep it and thereby our need for a savior. That's why it says Christ was the, or the law was a tutor that was, a supposed, it was supposed to toot us. Doot, doot. It's supposed to toot us unto Christ. And Christ is the schoolmaster. So when the tutor got us to realize 
who the actual law was about, Jesus, the, t the tutor goes away, and we walk into the newness of life that the schoolmaster gives. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Verse 9 through 12. Every saddle on which the person with the discharge rides becomes unclean. Whoever then touches any of the things which were under him shall be unclean until evening, and he who carries them shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Likewise, whomever the one with the discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. However, an earthenware vessel which the person with the discharge touches shall be broken, and every wooden vessel shall be rinsed in water. And again, it just shows that the state of the uncleanliness is maintained until cleansing takes place. And even to the point where certain things will have to be done away with because the uncleanliness touched it. An earthenware vessel, essentially a, a piece of pottery. If you have a bowl that's pottery, you touched it while you're unclean, you were not allowed to keep it, you had to smash it and throw it away. So you could see how this had become ailing in that you'd be separated from society it'd be costly because you'd have to get rid of certain things and then you're going to end up having to uh, sacrifice to atone for your sin verse 13 through 15 now when the man with the discharge becomes cleansed from his discharge then he shall count off for himself seven days for his cleansing he shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in running water and will become clean then on the eighth day he shall take for himself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and come before Yahweh at the doorway of the tent of meeting and give them to the priest and the priest shall offer them, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. So the priest shall make atonement on behalf before Yahweh, on his behalf before Yahweh because of his discharge. So consider this, if you are unclean, you're unclean all the days of your discharge. So you might, be, you, you might have a discharge for a day. You might have a discharge for a year. And however long the discharge maintains, you're unclean. And then when the discharge stops, you don't get to just reintegrate back into society. You maintain that status of being separated for yet another seven days. Then on the eighth day, you're able to bathe then you get to bring your offering to the Lord and you get to get cleansed ritually, spiritually. But I do want you to notice this. You're isolated for seven days after you're cleansed. Again, where does it say? Let me look it up right away. Hold on. In verse 13, it says, When the man who has the discharge becomes cleansed, you're now fully clean physically. When the man becomes clean, he has to wait seven more days. So even though you might physically be cleansed, there is still a spiritual cleansing that needs to take place before God will allow that person to reintegrate back into the camp. It's like antibiotics. That's a real thing that happens with sin. When we sin, sometimes the, 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 the consequences come immediately. Sometimes they're prolonged. However, when it feels like all is past, the truth is it's not. The truth is the consequences often still continue to come with time yet to come. Is that fair? Nah, but that's how sin works. But, but I, I repented and asked for forgiveness. But yeah, you've sowed seeds of doubt, anger, dis dissent and strife. And you know what happens when you sow seeds? They produce fruit. And when you sow bad seeds, you know what kind of fruit it produces? Bad fruit. And when bad fruit comes, you know what it looks like? It looks like doubt, fear, anger, often sin. And so oftentimes we fall into trials of sin, and then we repent of that sin and we get right. Sometimes there's immediate consequences, sometimes they're prolonged, and then we move past and it feels like it's gone. But then we start to reap some of the fruit of that bad seed that we sowed. It's called the law of sowing. The things we sow today, we can expect to reap in six months to a year. Sometimes sooner, sometimes later. But I see it in the lives of believers often where they're in the cycle of sin. And then they finally come to a place where they're at the end of themselves and they repent and they get right and then they get their walk gets strong. 
And it's like everything is going haywire while their walk is strong. And they, they don't understand it. And I'm like, well, you spent quite a bit of time sowing some bad seed, bro. And all this good seed you've been sowing, you're going to have to wait a little bit of time to reap that fruit. It's one of the reasons where all see believers fall off. Because the good fruit will come in, their walk will be strong, and they might actually start to fall off physically, and they'll start doing little sins, right? But they're reaping the good fruit that they sowed several months back. And so then the inclination comes that, I think God's okay with my sin. Because I'm being blessed even though I'm messing up. No, you're just reaping the fruit from the good seed you sowed several months back. And then you start to reap the bad fruit, and then it's this crazy cycle. Anyways, when you're cleansed, he says, then seven more days you go for the purity. Verses 16 through 18, and this, it gets a little weird. Young ladies, I'm sorry, it's what it is. Now if a man has a seminal emission, he shall bathe all his body in water and become unclean until evening. As for any garment or any leather on which there is a seminal emission, it shall be washed with water and be unclean until evening. Now we're not told why semen is impure or impure. We're not, we're not told. Only that it is. And anything that comes into contact with semen or sperm is unclean. So this begs the question, if a husband and wife have sex, are they unclean? Verse 18. If a man lies with a woman so that there is a seminal emission, they shall both bathe in water and be unclean until evening. That's, that's kind of difficult. If you wake up in the morning and want to have you know, a, a relation session with your wife, you got to set the whole day aside because you're now unclean and you're prohibited from going forward in society cleansed. You have, I mean, hey boss, I can't come in. Me and my wife hooked up this morning. You would be prohibited from going to work because from, from, of what you would do is you would spread that uncleanness throughout. Now, why is this? I don't know. I don't know. What I do know is that would make sex difficult. You'd have, to, you'd have to work it out so that it's played out in a strategic way that's going to be beneficial. Because again, you know, back in the day, you couldn't just skip work. You know, they were reliant on their crops. The crops were reliant on them, on them doing the proper work and the proper agricultural duties so that their crops would be healthy and good. And so you can't just skip work. I've never been a farmer, but like, I like watching like little shorts and shows and stuff like how farmers work and there isn't time for breaks. You have to be on it every single day, all day long. And so, when it came to sex, there was a bit of an issue because the seminal emission would thereby make the people unclean. No morning sex, unless it's on a day off. <laughs> if you're married, you know. If you're not, it's okay. One day... Verse 19, when a woman has a discharge, <laughs> when a woman has a discharge, if her discharge in her body is blood, she shall continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days. And whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Everything also on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean. Anyone who touches her bed shall wash his clothes, bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. Whoever touches anything on which she sits shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening, whether it be on the bed or on the thing which she is sitting. When he touches it, he shall be unclean until evening. Now, why do you suppose they're unclean for seven days? That's the period. That's the period process. For seven days, your body cleanses. It sheds that egg and, you know, and re, it drops a new one. And it, I don't know how the whole process works exactly, but that's the essence. When you're bleeding, your body's shedding that egg and that lining and it's reformatting for a new one, preparing for the possibility of a seminal emission so that the, the egg would be planted by the seed and then it would bear fruit, which we call kids. Here's one for you ladies, just so you know, if you ever plan to have kids, your body has a certain amount of eggs. When they're gone, they're gone. If you ever want to have kids, pray to God for a husband earlier than later. 
You could chance it and be like, I'm going to pull a Rebecca, I'm going to pull a Sarah or a Teresa, and you know, we're going to have kids when we're old. <laughs> My wife and I, when we had our son Ezekiel, I think we were 34, 33, 34, we're considered, we were considered geriatric parents. What that means is we are old parents. That's what it means. That's what it means. That is a very real medical term. When you're geriatric, uh, complications shoot through the roof. Having a child after 35 could actually be dangerous for the mother. You get into your 40s, the older you get, the more dangerous it becomes and the less likely it becomes. Because your body has a preset amount of eggs with, within you. And when those eggs are gone, they're gone. They're, you can't have children at that point. Um, sorry, I just thought I'd throw that out there since we're talking about the periods. But when you have your period, you're dirty. <laughs> Biblically, you know, uh, in, in, in the Israeli camp, you know, you weren't allowed to touch it. You had to segregate. So you get like a seven-day vacation once a month. Quarantine. You had to quarantine. You know, women are the original COVID-19 quarantines, you know. Maybe quarantine for seven days since back in the day, you know what I mean? That just... You know, that was the law. The law said that when you were on that menstrual discharge, you were unclean for seven days. And you weren't allowed to go out. You weren't allowed because you were ritualistically unclean. By you going out, you defile everyone you touch. You defile everything you touch. If you touch, if you're walking by somebody's tent and you touch it, their home is now unclean. It's messed up, right? I mean, that's, that's a harsh thing to hear. I want you to consider this. I believe it's in Mark chapter 5. It's, a, it, it's in several of the Gospels for sure in Mark. There is a woman who has a discharge for 12 years. She has an issue in which her blood flow goes for 12 years off and on. But it's a continual process. Like, it's not a period. It's, there's something else going on. And for 12 years, she was segregated from society. Remember it says that she spent all her money. She, she gave up everything she had to doctors trying to figure out what was going wrong, trying to get fixed. And, well, I don't know what she needed, but she was unclean is what she was. And what happened was she was segregated from society. She was a loner. She was the true essence of life on um, hell in real life, being separated and segregated from family, from church, from home. You'd have been kicked out of your house. You wouldn't be allowed to stay in the house because you'd make the family unclean. You had to go. You'd have to live out in the, in, the, in the outskirts of town, be a vagrant and a wanderer. You couldn't even be a beggar because you'd make anybody unclean you came in contact with. And it was your duty to let people know you were unclean. Twelve years. And then she touched the fringe of Jesus' cloak and was healed. In verse 24, this one is a little interesting, but it says, if any man actually lies with her so that her menstrual impurity is on him, <laughs> her period blood, he shall be unclean seven days. And it could be more than, oh, here it says specifically menstrual. He shall be unclean seven days, and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. If a man has sex with a woman while she's on her period he would bear the same amount of uncleanness as she would. He would have to remain seven days from that point forward unclean. And then he'd have to go through the same process for her to get cleansed. So that was a big no-no. Verse 25 through 27, Now if a woman has a discharge of her blood many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond that period, and I meant to mention this here about the woman for 12 years, all the days of her, of her impure discharge, she shall continue as though in her menstrual impurity. She is unclean. Any bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be like her, shall be to her like a bed of, uh, shall be to her like her bed at menstruation, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean like her uncleanliness at that time, her uncleanness at that time. Likewise, whoever touches them shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. So for someone who has a discharge that's not for menstruation and it's just a continual discharge, they maintain that uncleanness going forward. Now, I wrote this down, so I'm just going to read it because the, these are results... These are things that could result in such a case. One's called anov uh, anovulation. Uh, intercourse could be an issue for that when you know if the skin rips through intercourse and there's a blood 
issue, you would be considered unclean. Uh, uterine fibroids, ovulation, uterine or cervical cancer, these are things that could create a blood flow continually. So when I think about the woman with the blood flow for like 12 years, there's a really good chance she had uterine cancer. Doesn't mean that's what she had. We don't know what she had. But there's a good reason to believe that she may have because it was a continual blood flow that would continue to come. Which is what I wrote down because these are real medical issues and that could be the case. In verse 28 through 30, it says, When she becomes clean from her discharge... She shall count off for herself, for herself seven days, and afterward she will be clean. Then on the eighth day she shall take for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them into the priest to the doorway of the tent of meeting. The priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. So the priest shall make atonement on her behalf before Yahweh because of her impure discharge. So she shall be clean. And how many days shall she segregate herself yet? That's 14 days out of the week at minimum. Out of the week, out of the month, sorry, you know, 14 days in a week. That, that, that's two weeks out of an entire month. Essentially, that's half, that's half the month. That means, and that doesn't include when there was sexual intercourse, or there was, or what? I got, I'm very limited on time. Go ahead. I wasn't there. The fact is she spent more than half her life likely in an unclean state. Because then there's a the sexual intercourse where there's seminal emission. There's the accidentally touching a dead bug. There's a number touching somebody else's uncleanness. There were a number of things that would procure throughout a person's life in which they would become unclean. This is one that was set every single month. So a woman would spend more than half her life likely in an unclean state. That is a hard way to live life. Again, the impossibility of the law. It was never meant to be on our shoulders and on our backs. It was meant to be uplifted and lived out through our Messiah and we are made righteous because of His perfect fulfilling of that law. Now, if you don't like that, go live the law. Go live it out. Go have a blast being unclean left and right, especially in our dirty culture. Go have a blast having to be so religious that you are in a constant state of trepidation because of your wickedness and your, 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 your faults before God. It is impractical. It's just, it's impractical. Verse, Sorry. Verse 31 through 33 to the rest of the chapter. Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness, so they will not die in their uncleanness by their defiling my tabernacle that is among them. This is the law for the one who has a discharge and for the man who has a seminal emission, so that he is unclean by it, and for the woman who is ill because of menstrual impurity, and for the one who has a discharge, whether a male or a female, or a man who lies with an unclean woman. I think somebody got offended. <laughs> I don't know what happened. He took off though, but well, too bad. You know, but hear what he said. He says these are the laws for uncleanness, and they are to be kept and adhered to, so that you don't defile God's tabernacle. And what does it say? And anybody, nobody's paying attention, and die. Die. The, wake up. That's an important one. Die. You don't want to die. Why does that matter to me? That's Old Testament because there's a lot of people who live impure lives now and when they stand before God, He's going to tell them, get away from me because I don't know you. So this matters. Being impure still matters because if you're not cleansed by the Lord, then you don't have a part in the Lord. But I was cleansed by the Lord. You better have the fruit to show it. Because Jesus said, if you don't have the fruit to show it, many will say to me on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, I'm cleansed by you. And he's going to say, I don't know you. Busta, bounce. Bounce. And I'm afraid a lot of Christians are going to hear the words, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Because we have preached a false gospel here in America and across the world for centuries, false gospels have been preached. The gospel of grace and love and there is no judgment. God just loves you. You keep being you. If you think that God's good with you being you, you don't know God. God accepts you as you are, but He requires change. 
You think God is going to make an investment in you by giving up His Son so that you can live your crusty old life the way it is? The way I am? No, God desires change in us. His goal, the Bible says, is to conform us. Do you know what that conforming is to? Anybody? His image. We are conformed to His image. He is making us like Christ. And if we are not becoming like Christ, there's a really good chance we don't belong to Christ. Impurity. He says, pay attention guys so that you follow this so that you don't die. And to the New Testament, he says, pay attention because if you're not being conformed to the image of my son, when that day comes, you will die. But it's grace and mercy. It is grace and mercy. So surrender to it. Don't use grace and mercy as an excuse to abuse sin. It's what a lot of us do in the Western society. We cry love, grace, peace, mercy in Christianity so that we don't have to repent of our sin so that we can continue living in it. But that's not the desire of the Lord. His desire is that we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind. He wants us to think different. And when we think different, you know what we do? We live different. When we think different, you know what we say? We speak different. We hear different. We are different. So we what? We have a part. But a lot of us don't want a part. No, but let's keep going. God again is showing through Israel how holy he is. But again, with these restrictions through the law comes great weight. But with this great weight also comes provision. And that's where chapter 16 comes in. And this won't take us long. We'll actually go through this fairly quickly. But in chapter 16, God announces atonement for the nation of Israel. Verse 16, now Yahweh spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Again, God addresses Moses specifically on this. So not Moses and Aaron, but Moses. That's his primary spokesman. Again, after the two sons of Aaron, when they had approached the presence of Yahweh and died. So that sets the basis for what God is going to present here. Do you guys remember what happened to the sons of Aaron? They were turned to barbecue, kind of. It's kind of mean, but he, he roasted them, literally. Fire came out and consumed them. They, they died. They were fried, literally. And they were died, and they died. We'll get to it here to it here in a moment. But they died because of their because of their treating God as unholy, and and we'll see what's meant by that. Now, what God's going to make mention of here is the holy of holies. That is, this is that little room. If you guys remember, in the tabernacle to the far back, that was God's throne room. The Bible says that His Spirit dwelt above the cherubim. Good after evening. God's spirit dwelt above the cherubim and you weren't allowed to walk in that room except for once a year under certain conditions even on that once a year you weren't just allowed to barge in you had to be a special person and there had to be special conditions at play let's look into it then Yahweh said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. There is the backdrop against chapter 10. Aaron shall not enter in at any time. What does that mean? Aaron's not free to come back here when he wants. Aaron doesn't get to barge into my spot and treat me with disdain. Well, that's mean of God. That's how holy God is. Did you know in the Bible, there are four beings that surround the presence of God in the New Testament? When, Paul, when, when John is in heaven describing what he sees, do you know what those, an, those angels are called? Cherubim. You know what they're doing? Well, their wings are spread out. They have six, uh, three sets of wings, two up, two down, and two on the sides. They have hands, they have feet, they have four faces, one of a man, one of a lion, one of an ox, and one of a... What's the last one? Lion, ox, man. Lion, ox, man. Goodness, I can't remember. An eagle, thank you. I could not get that out of me for the life. Did you? I didn't hear you. And an eagle, thank you. And there are four of these beings that surround God. And they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And they cry it out day and night. 
You know what I personally believe they're doing? I don't think they're protecting God. I, I get the inclination that they're protecting the onlookers from the glory of God killing them. Because the glory of God holds so much weight that should you experience the full presence and the full weight of God's glory, you would die. You want to know why I say that? Because when Moses asked God to see his glory, God said, no, you'll die. You'll die. Even the angels have to cover their eyes and their feet. Because the weight of God's glory is so magnificent. His holiness is a weight that... You weren't just allowed to barge into God's spot unannounced or uninvited more particularly. Or death was the consequence. And Moses' sons experienced that. Because to treat God with such contempt and disregard for His holiness, that would be the outcome. In verse 3 it says, Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So he says, Aaron will enter under these conditions. There's two offerings he's going to bring forth and these offerings were for him specifically. One was a bull for a sin offering and then a ram for a burnt offering. He's going to cover his sin and give to God this whole offering. In verse 4, he shall put on the holy linen tunic and the linen undergarments shall be next to his body and he shall be girded with the linen sash and attire with the linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. So we see that Aaron is to take off all his glorious robes. Remember, he had all that gold, the fancy stuff. He had that breastplate that had the 12 stones that represented Israel, the golden chains, that big turban with the golden covering with the words written on it. And he looked glamorous. When it came time to go before the Lord, the glamour comes off. And he puts on the work robes of the regular priests. And I believe there's a reason for that. When it came time for Aaron to represent the nation of Israel in the forgiveness of their sins, he didn't come in glamour, but humility. And I believe that's one of the key traits of a repentant heart. Someone who comes in true humility. If you come with glamour and fancy words and you're just trying to keep up with the lingo, oh, you may not be repenting, bro. You might just be trying to put a show on to pretend like you're repenting. Repentance is accompanied by sorrow and by humility and being humbled. And I believe that's the essence of what's being said here. Verse 5 through 11, the offerings are given up. He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. Then Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household. Right away, Aaron had to cleanse himself first. He had to be cleansed of his sin first before he could approach God to make, make a cleansing offering for the nation of Israel. And I think that still applies. We first have to come to the presence of the Lord and get right before we can help other people stand strong. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're in a weird place, you can still help people. But that's part of the beauty of Christianity. It doesn't take much but four seconds. Forgive me, Lord. <sighs> Let's do this. But we should be in a right mind, in a right state. We should have our heart right in forgiveness before we're here trying to bring people into that same forgiveness. Now, if you're whacked out and God put someone before you, God can use you in spite of you. Been there, done that. But we should be right first. And it doesn't take much to get right. It doesn't take much. Just some humility. That's it. But Aaron had to get clean before he was able to go in and make a cleansing offering for the nation. Verse 7, He shall take the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other lot for the scapegoat. So essentially, if you remember a few chapters ago, there's the one that's offered and the one that's set loose of the animals. So one goat's going to die. The other goat's going to get blood smeared on it, sins transferred symbolically, and it's going to get sent off into the, into the wilderness to never return. We talked about that. I'll mention it again a little bit as we go forward, but not much because we've already talked about it. Verse 9, Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for Yahweh fell and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for the scapegoat 
shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. And I guess it was closer than I thought. Again, the idea was the sin would be transferred to the scapegoat. And when they sent it off into the wilderness, it was symbolic of the sin of the nation leaving permanently to never return again. And it was really a beautiful thing, kind of dirty. You know, have you guys noticed that there's a lot of blood that is perpetuated in all these ritualistic, you know, ceremonies? I believe that's for a purpose. It's to show how dirty sin is. Christianity is a bloody and a dirty religion. It is. Well, we're not a religion. We're, we're a relationship. Yeah, but there are religious aspects. And it's, it's very dirty. And it goes to show the weight of the uncleanliness of humanity and the lengths God is willing to go to redeem us to himself. I don't like the idea of a bloody savior I, either. That's horrible. But then there's such a beauty in it that God would love us so much. That he would give himself up so that we would never have to die. He would experience true death on our behalf so that we would never have to. Very bloody religion, bloody faith. The sin would be transferred, the scapegoat would be sent out. Verse 12 and 13, or 11, 12 and 13, Then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, to make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before Yahweh and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire before Yahweh that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the ark of the testimony. Otherwise, he will die. So now Aaron actually enters into the most holy place. Now the first thing he has to do is take a pan put coals of fire in it from the altar of incense, and then take incense and put it into the pan so that the smoke would rise and fill the room. And it had to fill the room to such a degree that the mercy seat was unable to be seen, or else he would die. That's harsh. Why was that law put in play? I don't know. But again, it tells me that the holiness of God is not something to be trifled with. It's not something that we disregard. But again, I look at the faith today and there is such a disregard for, for the holiness of God, especially in Christianity. There are so many sects of Christianity where God's holiness is just, it's abused in the name of grace. It should not be so. And then he shall sprinkle the blood of the bull, and it shall be sprinkled for himself. Verse 15 through 16, he now does it for the nation. Or did I read verse 14? Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull offering, in verse 14, of the bull, and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat. On the east side, also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. He's now making atonement for himself. Verse 15 and 16, Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities." In like manner, he takes the blood of the goat and he sprinkles it on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. And again, we've already seen where the scapegoat is sent out. And what's happening here is he is making atonement for the nation of Israel, the high priest. And what we see taking place here is the progressive nature of atonement. This is the third time that we see atonement being issued out for people. If we were to rewind to Genesis chapter 3, we see that when Adam and Eve sinned, something died in their place. Now, we're not given all of the exactitudes of what happened, but we know that God covered them with animal skins. I believe he did that physically, and there was a symbolism there that their sin was covered because something died in their place. Otherwise, they should have died themselves, right? That's the first time we see God covering humanity, and God allows a covering for a couple, then we fast forward several thousand years into the book of Exodus. We get to chapter 12. And God allows a lamb for a household to be covered. 
under the Passover institution. So at first there's the covering for a couple, then it's the covering for a household. Now we get to the Day of Atonement where God allows for the covering of a nation. And this covering here was allowed for a year. This, this covered the sin of the nation for the previous year. And they wouldn't have to do this again to the following year, and we'll see when that was instituted. And in the progressive nature of atonement, we get to the pinnacle of it in John chapter 1, verse 29, where the, 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 the hairy man, John the baptizer, looks on and sees his cousin Jesus coming and goes, oh, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So now it's no longer the covering for a couple, nor a household, nor even a nation, but it's the covering for humanity. And that's the progressive nature of atonement. Verse 17 through 19. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before Yahweh and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar on all sides. With his finger he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it seven times and cleanse it from the impurities of the sons of Israel and consecrate it. For the impurity of the sons of Israel consecrate it. And what I do want to say here is I do find it interesting in verse 17 that it says when the high priest does this, no one shall be present in the tabernacle. Everybody had to be removed. And that tells me that when the high priest would intercede on behalf of the people, it was an extraordinarily private matter. And it took me to the New Testament when Jesus is hanging on the cross, dying for the sin of the world. Because you, you want to know what happens? The land goes dark and no one can see what's going on. And as God is judging the body of Christ for our sins, kind of like the high priest when he goes in, everybody's removed they don't get to see what happens no one gets to see what happens between the son and the father on the cross because the land goes dark the bible says they couldn't see they didn't know and when the lord dealt with our sin it was an extraordinarily private matter sin is a private matter now by private it means we don't exploit it we don't we don't stage it for the world to see let's not hop on facebook and share all of our sin You can, I did that once, and boch. That's where you meet all the religious zealots. And you'll get lynched. By some, you'll get encouraged by others. But you find people you trust, and you share with them what's going on, and you allow them to intercede. And when people share their issues with me in particular, it's a private matter. It's between you, the Lord, and I'm somewhat as an intercessor. Somewhat. You don't necessarily need me, but sometimes it's... It is needed that we, we need the help of a brother or sister to bear our burdens, as Galatians 6 one says. But it's a private matter when sin is dealt with. It's not something that we throw on a stage and we showcase for, for the world. Don't do that. Find someone you trust. Confide in them and trust that they'll keep it between the Lord, you, and themselves. And it's also okay for you to go straight to the Lord. That's part of the beauty in our faith is the Lord opened the veil to, the, to all humanity that we all have access to the presence of the Lord ourselves. You don't need me to get right with God. All you need to know is the Lord to get right with God. But there is a beauty when a brother can walk alongside you or a sister and lock arms and pray with you and pray for you and help you walk. And that's sometimes why we confide in others is so that we're not walking alone. And sometimes we're having a hard time standing. Well, they pick us up and help us stand. But going forward, verse 20 through 22. When he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of of a man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. And again, I already talked about this, so I'm not going to harp on it further. Verse 23, Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments which he put on and went into the holy place. And he shall leave them there. He shall bathe his body with water in the holy place and put on his clothes and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the 
burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. Then he shall offer up in smoke the fat that is the sin offering on the altar. The one who released the goat shall... The one who released the goat as the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body with water. Then afterward he shall come into the camp. But the bull of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement to the holy place, shall be taken outside the camp, where they shall burn their hides, their flesh, and their refuse with fire. Then the one who burns them shall wash his clothes, bathe his, bathe his body with water. Then afterward he shall come into the camp. So the high priest changes out of his work clothes, gets back in his high priestly garments, and he continues forward with the ritualistic offerings for the people and so forth, the burnt offerings, the scapegoat, and he continues forward in his work. Again, these are, I feel like it's being repetitive because in like the first nine verses, it talked about these things. And then it kind of reiterates just in different stages how it goes forward. So it's not necessary to sit there and harp on it. And in verse 29, there shall be a permanent statute for you in the seventh month on the tenth day of the month. You shall humble, humble your souls and not do any work, whether the native or the alien who sojourns among you. For it is this day, it is a holy day, it shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean from all your sins before Yahweh. It is to be a Sabbath of solemn rest for you that you may humble your souls. It is a permanent statute. So the priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement. He shall thus put on the linen garments, the holy garments, and make atonement for the holy sanctuary. He shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. He shall also make atonement for the priest and for all the people of the assembly. Now you shall have this as a permanent statute to make atonement for the sons of Israel for all their sins once every year. And just as Yahweh had commanded Moses, so he did. And again, this is the day of atonement. And once a year, the nation's sins would be cleansed collectively. This wasn't necessarily a specific sin is just a very general anything that they may have done once you they would be wiped away at this day um that being said i'm a little over but still enough on time i highly want to encourage you guys you know we have a savior who has done this for us and we don't have to wait once a year to have our sins cleansed you can do it right now i don't know your guys's lives in and out but you know them and if you're at a place where you feel at odds with the lord Repenting is as simple as humbling your heart and asking for forgiveness. And God is so gracious. He's not going to make you buy some bulls and goats. You ain't got to go through all this crazy stuff. Go, you know, buy a butcher, get him cut. No. Humble your heart and ask for forgiveness. And because Jesus already paid the price for our sin, the moment you ask, it's done. And all you have to do is move forward. That moving forward part on our end is not always the easiest because we like to hold ourselves down. We like to hold on to this sin and we refuse to let it go. Let it go. Get right with God. Move forward. Open hands. Let God fill your hands. Don't fill your own hands. If you fill your own hands, you're going to have a lot of problems. Let God fill your hands. That being said, Lord, thank you for being God and thank you for your goodness, mercy, and grace. Thank you for your forgiveness, Lord for the truest of atonements by your blood. As we go forward through the rest of this week, we pray that you would lead, guide, and direct us in righteousness, that you'd help us to walk according to your will, Lord. Help us not to be religious zealots, but help us to be loving, kind, to be strong, to stand firm in the faith, Lord, to be honest in your word, to allow your word to transform us and to conform us to your image. We just love you and we want you more than anything, Lord. We bless your holy name and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.